Its Origins and Development by R. Campbell Thompson. Gega Ku Gar An R. Dupshika Ishakan. The house admit its bondage and the liquid and such. We are seeing, um, you know, see Leviticus 14 42. Then he shall take the other mortar and plaster the house. The words in the Syrian are Aempar or Me Gasa and Thy feet and come. Karpete sha shu ru cha ta katam inna shapa kama tepe and the man that carrieth. I mean the verse that contains that. See Leviticus four. 1846. Moreover, he goeth into the house all the while that it is shut up, shall be unclean until the even. See Numbers 1910. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even. And the seven days, see the Assyrian number seven. The Assyrian number may be seven, and seven days is the limit in Leviticus 14.38 for the priest to be shut up in the house until his return. We have burrito corn, overlay the flour, the whole, the bitumen, plaster oil, cedar of each door, thou shalt set a censer, burning cypress and cedar, that man shall sprinkle with water, and the man who dwelleth Nothing approaches man, and there's the following spell. The incantation, break the bonds of her who hath bewitched me. Brought to naught the mutterings of her who hath cast spells on me. Turn her sorcery to wind, her mutterings to air. All that she hath done are wrought in the magic. May the wind carry away. May it bring her days to ruin and a broken heart. May it bring down her years to wretchedness and woe. May she die, but let me recover. May her sorcery, her magic, her spells be loosed by command of Ea, Shamash, Marduk, and the princess, Balit Ela. Perform the incantation. The prayer when sorcery appeareth in a man's house, thou shalt wash in water and offer a black ox Repeat this incantation seven times and the sorcery will be loosed. And the torch of to the Birberida kernels. See Leviticus 5.52 And he shall cleanse the, cleanse the house with the blood of the bird, with the running water, with the living bird, the cedar wood, and with the hyssop and the scarlet. Kind of sounds like voodoo, doesn't it? And overlaying the floor, the sipu. And why there's the ilu in the text, I cannot explain. Oh, each door of the entity. Um, instead of sprinkling with water, we see or that man shall sprinkle water and sprinkle the house seven times. And again, we're looking at Leviticus 5, 51. And the man who dwelleth, there's something in there. I cannot translate. Su'un enna udda al tilla. It may mean until the day of his recovery. And... 
this last spell that we've looked at. Um, we have kid dutche to so much. In the bit of in water, offering to garib or to shakal. This is evidently something akin in Assyrian Upshashu Upshashu Sorcery to the Hebrew Shrat Leprosy In Leviticus, the house may show a plague in its walls with hollow strikes, greenish or reddish which may or may not increase seven days. There is no evidence that leprosy in the modern sense of the word existed among the Jews at this period. The Tzrat compromised a number of cutaneous disorders, chief among which are the vitiligo and psoriasis. This is clearly some form of damp or dry rot. Evidently, the early house builder, builders associated it with associated it with magic, and, Le, and the Levitical account really retains the primitive belief. The amplification in the Talmud also hints that the origin is to be sought in the hostile magic. The round house is immune, and this recalls the wizard circle. The three-cornered house. It's the same, doubtless, for the magic number three, and we may also instance the pentacle in comparison with its angular shape. A ship, according to the Talmud, is always clean, Sabbath 9-2, and hence the cabins and fighting tops will also be clean. The immunity of the house built on four beams is not so easy to explain when it is particularized that a square house is not exempt. If, however, the beams be understood as piles, the house will come into the same category as the ship, the water being the safeguard. We have seen, then, that the scapegoat atonement and the purification ceremony for the leper and the leprous house are ordinary, savage, uh, are ordinary magic. This is an indication that we may pursue our investigations into other unclean taboos on the individual taking first those which cannot be called sins by any extension of the word. Touching anything unclean or a dead body, a woman after childbirth, or abnormal issues, clearly represent the, ta the tabooed condition of, wit of one who not only runs the risk of danger from spirits, but may have given physical indication of the effects of their hostility. All these demand piacular offerings. The corpse may so infest a tribesman that he invites the return of the restless ghost to plague him with sickness. Similarly, that which is unclean will have the latest potentialities for disease. The woman in childbed, uh, in childbed is infectious through jealousy through the jealousy of spirits who are hostile because of the successful result of her marriage with a man, and she herself may even die from their attack, as in pure peril fever. Abnormal issues are by their nature diseases and are clearly due to demons. Well, that's how they thought, right? It's to be noticed the booze against ordinary issues, those were in the function is perfectly natural or regular, do not require an atonement, but merely a, purifica a purificatory ritual. This coincides entirely with our knowledge of the ostensible operation of the spirits, the Baal Kre, and the woman in her courses are not the women in their courses are not supposed to be possessed by mischievous demons, whose power is merely transient. It's getting rumbling in the tumbler. I don't know if you can hear that. 
there is no question of disease in these cases, but right here, a condition is a peculiarity in which any member of the tribe may be subject without resultant hurt, and the succuba or incubus leaves the person. To the savage mind, this is a certainty, because no man or woman is permittently sick from such natural functions, nor do they die. Hence, after the lelu or leleth has departed, purification is the only right demanded. But, on the other hand, abnormal issues come under the head of protected possessions disease, and demand an elaborate atonement to drive out the demon who intends remaining. Similarly, eating unclean beasts demands only purification, Leviticus 9.40, and this can easily be traced to the primitive source. The unclean beast is the totem beast, which it is nefast to eat or kill, except in great occasions, but there is often nothing inherently unclean or dangerous about its flesh to produce sickness. Well, the meat-eating land animals and and the scavengers and stuff. Yeah, most people in their life, if they are okay with eating these, are going to get something that's only in these. Um, or at least one per family. And then there's going to be diseases that they're going to get from that. That exists in other things too, but you know. Hence, accidental experimentation, uh, ac hence, accidental experiment probably showed that the spirit infection or divine wrath did not follow as a matter of course if he did eat it occasionally. If nothing more was unnecessary was necessary to cleanse him from this breach and purification, doubtless many things without fins and scales were capable of making him very sick at certain seasons, but there are obviously many totems which are absolutely innocuous. Well, not not all the kosher laws or of issue um, with the physical world. Some of them sounds like they were thrown in. Um, a most important question in these atonements is the meaning of the unwitting sins. And as this seems to be the best point to discuss, then we must leave the explanation of the other special taboos until later. There are surely a hundred sins or breaches of taboo that a man may commit daily in all innocence without knowing that he's actually broken any of the tribal laws, notably in the matter of contagion. If he has done these unwittingly, how will he know when to bring his peacular offering? And even then, what is the particular reason for the sacrifice? There must clearly be some physical and apparent result from his breach of taboo. This is certain otherwise the Levitical law would never describe the action prior to the atonement as an unwitting sin. Hence, by applying a hypothesis of the connection of the demons with the taboo and sickness, the obvious explanation is that the man falls sick and is at a loss to know what he has done that should have brought down such a supernatural visitation. He therefore goes to the priest-physician for relief. He cannot remember all his previous actions so that the priest may exercise the particular form of the demon which is troubling him, and hence the only diagnosis possible is that of an unwitting sin or breach of taboo. This is clearly indicated in the Assyrian Sherpu series. The man has fallen sick, and the priest is to heal him with the treatment prescribed in these tablets. But, although it is perfectly clear from the internal evidence of the text that the man is ill, it is to be it is to a breach of the mammoth or a boo that such disease is ascribed and is the particular sin which the patient has committed, which the priest is trying to cleanse. The possible taboos which the sick man may have broken are given in 163 forms in the third tablet under each each under the title Mamet. The fifth tablet begins with the lines, An evil curse, Arat, like a Galu demon, hath attacked the man, and the aid of sympathetic magic 
is called in to drive it away by shredding and burning garlic, dates, hair, and wool. The seventh tablet begins still more explicitly. Demetu hath gone forth from the deep. Mamet hath come down from the heavens. And a Chazu demon hath covered the earth as with grass. Under the four winds, overwhelming with dread, burning like fire, they smite the folk of all places, torturing their bodies. It is therefore obvious that demons, taboo, and sickness were all held to be in close relation to one another, and that a breach of taboo rendered a man liable to attract the attention of a spirit which might affect him with the disease, the very fact that the sorcerer priest, in treating his patient according to the rules in the Sherpu series, repeats 163 taboos, shows that he does not know exactly what sin the man has committed, just as he will run through a long category of spirit names when he exercises the demon from the sick man. So will he gabble off a string of trespasses, in any one of which the man may have been guilty. It is immaterial whether he knows which one it is, provided that his diagnosis mentions the name of the demon in one case, or the sin in the other. It is enough. We have therefore ample proof that the Sherpu series was written in order to provide the magicians with the means of cleansing sick men from the effect of unwitting sins. From this, it is an easy step to understand that the unwitting sins of, of Leviticus were always followed by some physical manifestation in the unlucky man, or inversely sickness was held to be the result of an unwitting breach of taboo, which demand an atonement to free the sick man from the demon he had attracted. And the views of Coverley in Sung Un Gnade, 1905, on the Babylonian ideas, We Sund Krankheit Un Verhexung. Zusammen Gehoren so Vergebung Heilung Un Kraftiger Exorcismus Der Sunder ist Patient Die Heilers Ver Willikung Einkur Gnade Vergebung Eratung Befreiung Losung des Banners Us, USW Vesihen Sik Durkas auf das A Usere Ergehen des Betenden and the views in the Doctrine of Sin, the Babylonian religion, Morgan. Morgan Stearns of 1905, 3. In the Babylonian religious literature, the expression sin, uncleanliness, sickness, possessions by evil spirits are pure synonyms, but they denote an evil state of the body, the result of the divine anger. But, he says, sin must have originally been purely ritual. Either the man had neglected to offer his sacrifice, or else he had not offered it properly. Before the layman could bring his sacrifice, he had to be ritually clean, Sin was thus originally merely the transgression of ritual laws, and as such, appears throughout the Babylonian, the Babylonian religious literature. If I understand rightly what is meant by ritual, I cannot agree with him. Many sins, as we have seen, arose from the breach of unclean taboos, the original idea that a demoniac attack followed any meddling with unclean persons, but originally, at least, such a breach did not necessarily imply the immediate relations with an entity, but were entirely distinct and primarily concerned with the danger to fellow tribesmen. 
Doubtless, an unclean man came to be excluded from the worship, but ritual has nothing to do with the primitive ideas here. Again, this hypothesis that sin is due to a man not offering sacrifice duly or properly needs to be needs little disproof if the Sherpu taboos be read with intelligence. At the same time, he's quite correct, I believe, when he says, the cursing of sickness, the expulsion of evil spirits, and the expiation of sins are identical. And it might help if we see, the, you know, if we had more of the list of the taboos. There's a couple lists that it would help drawing one's own conclusions to see them. But it's important when you do a ritual, you know, you do got to try to do it right. You do got to try to do it with the right spirit and the feeling. You don't just show up and, then, and you know, um, you know, you, you, you sit up respectfully and all that sort of stuff. Um, or you stand and bow and wave your arm in a particular way or however it's done. The next point to dismiss is the distinction which is made in the offering, the sacrificial meal, and the substitute. In other words, the burnt offering. And the, and the atonement. The burnt offering is the direct descendant of the sacrificial feast to which the entity in common with all the tribe was invited. In latter times, however, it was entirely consumed on the altar. But the sin offering is treated in several ways. Sometimes the directions are for the flesh, skin, and dung to be burned outside the camp, while the fat and the call and the kidneys are to be burnt on the altar. See Exodus 29, Leviticus 4, and Leviticus 8, 9. While the blood is to be sprinkled round about, frequently, on the other hand, nothing is said of the, cons the consumption of the carcass. Now, you know, making a point to handle the dung and sprinkle the blood. But, I mean, there's some disease-related things here. Exodus 30, Leviticus 4, 15, and 23. Sometimes the priest may eat it. Leviticus 6 and 14. Unless some of the blood has been brought into the tabernacle, the congregation when the whole must be burnt. The best explanation of these apparent contradictions seems to be that there is a confusion of the two systems, one of which is the more primitive method of cleansing the sick from the taboo. The uses of the blood and fat in these atonements demand some research into their origin, and we must find some hypothesis for the reason why the beast was slaughtered instead of having its neck broken, and why the fat was burnt on the altar. The blood question is, I think, to be explained thus. If we go back to the most primitive ideas, disassociating our views from the latter and probably corrupt customs of the Old Testament, we may find that the magician has to investigate, uh, has to invigil the demon out of the sick person into the substitute. Since he knows that the evil spirits are particularly attracted by blood, he cuts the throat of the beast, which is henceforth to be the receptacle of the demoniac influence. Throughout the whole conception of the Hebrew idea is the shedding of the blood, that is the life which affects the atonement, for it is the blood which maketh atonement by reason of the life, Leviticus 17.11, which is amplified in Hebrews 9.22. And according to the law, I may almost say all things are cleansed with the blood, and apart from the shedding of blood there is no remission, that is to say, uh, that is, to the Hebrews, the blood was the life shown in Leviticus 17.14 and Deuteronomy 12.23. It is worthy of remark in this connection that the Assyrian creation text, the entity's arm and their champion Marduk, saying, Go and cut off the life of Tiamat and let the wind carry her blood into secret places. And when the Marduk creates man, he does it with his blood. Moreover, the Assyrian exorcisms describe the devils as ceaselessly devouring blood. There are two questions from later writers, although worth considering. One from Moedides, although the blood 
was very unclean in the eyes of the Sabians, they nevertheless partook of it, because they thought it was the food of the spirits, and by eating it, man has something in common with the spirits, which, we're talking about the Yazidi, uh, a, a faction of them among the Sabians, actually, um, something in common with the spirits, which join him and tell future events, <laughs> sorry, according to the notion which people have generally, which people generally have of spirits. Now, just you know, there's a difference here between the polytheist and the at least monotheistic, if not monotheist, um, Jewish beliefs that we have represented in Leviticus, as shown, is well. There are certain rules on top of this. Okay. An atonement or blood must be shed. Okay. So, what are the conditions? And it's certainly not as we see about uh, Tiamat and such, where it is the entity that it, that people consider to be a god that's being sacrificed. There were. However, people who objected to eating blood as a thing naturally disliked by man. They killed a beast, received the blood in a vessel or pot, and ate of the flesh of that beast while sitting round the blood. They imagined that in this manner the spirits would come to partake of the blood, which was their food, whilst the idolaters were eating the flesh, that love, well, misassociators, perhaps uh, it's not all about idolatry, right? were eating the flesh, that love, brotherhood, and friendship with the spirits was established because they dined with the latter at one place and at the same time, that the spirits would appear to them in dreams, inform them of coming events, and be favorable to them. Uh, the Yazidi were also a people that, aside from trying to form a bond with the fire beings, they, uh, you know, they were sort of soothsayers, um, at least the uh, advanced among them. The second is from Origin. I mean, there are other names for the Yazidi. It's not just, um, you know, Avestan and Kurdish-based names, right? The second is from Origin. The sl um, says 3.34. The slaughter of victims is in itself enough to lure the demons to the heathen temples, but without that, they can be attracted to a place and laid therein by use of certain incantations. Are we to consider that these two writers are merely designating the entities of neighboring worshippers as devils in accordance with local fanaticism? Or must we here see some reminiscence of substitution to demons? What must be recognized is that this slaughter is by no means a sacrificial meal. In the Assyrian text, the beast is shown not to be eaten. Frequently directions are given for it to be thrown away as containing the evil influence and as such unfit for food. Pursuing an, the analogy of the attraction that blood has for spirits, we should see in the custom of burning the fat on the altar some similar design. It seems quite logical to say that just as the smell of newly shed blood invites the presence of devils, so will the sweet odor of burnt fat act as a bait, just as it has sweet savior unto Yahweh. The fat is Yahweh's, Leviticus 3.16, and this is to be paralleled for many tribes. Robertson Smith, his religion of the Semites, page 380, says that on the burning of the fat, and then he talks about uh, six pages later, on his views of the Viscera, kidneys, and liver being the seats of emotion, or more broadly, the fat of the momentum and the organs that lie near it. So, you know, there was reason why they picked certain parts. Devils can be repelled by an evil stench, as in the case of Asmodeus, and entities can be attracted by the sweet savior of sacrifices, as happened after the flood, both from the Hebrew and Babylonian accounts. Further, melted fat 
is the only fluid other than blood which can be offered in a libation from the sacrifice, which should be taken into account in reckoning its holiness. We shall not be far wrong in ascribing the possession of a keen sense of smell to all the Semitic spiritual world in agreement with their other rapacious appetites, armed with the practical knowledge of the irresistible attraction of blood and pleasant savor, the sorcerer could wheedle in the most recalcitrant devil from his patient. This, however, does not explain why, although the atonement is so charged with demoniac influence that occasionally became the priests, are why the holy altar of Yahweh should have been the place for the sacrifice. I do not think, however, that it requires great acumen to see that the piacular offerings of the Old Testament are in an extremely confused state when they are compared with each other. Ordinances are given for the disposal of the atonement sacrifices which seem most arbitrary in their differences. Nay, in one case, in the first chapter of Leviticus, the atonement idea is obviously confused with the sacrifice burnt offering. One has to. One only has to compare the modern Semitic folklore to see how entirely the two rites, sacrificial, feast, and piacular substitutes have been confused with one another. The fact must be recognized that analogy process universally admitted by scholars is responsible for the confusion, and that the, Levitical, that the Levitical injunction, they should no more offer their sacrifice to devils, includes a natural desire to bring the atonement sacrifices into accord with the ideas of dedication. We may therefore presume that the later magicians, perhaps, learnt that the substitute, which is supposed to have absorbed the demoniac influence, was not always so deadly as their ancestors accounted it. Leviticus 17.7, 1 Corinthians 10 and 20. On the contradictions and the different atonement ceremonies, compare Wellhausen, de Comp S. Hexet, and Histor. Uh, something about the Testaments, 1899, 136. Equal nur auf einen Funken. Auf auf die. Differenz idum sum dofertitis von der Strand der Nachtrag Leviticus 10, 16-20, Act Gedamen, Act. In Leviticus 4, Wird das Blut beim Gehorrechen sum dofer an die Horner des Frandofer Alters Gestrichen, Dagaden, Bein, Sundafer, Dice, Hochenpriesters, Undes, Vok.